Don't get me wrong. It just hasn't happened that way yet. Well, so it, it, when it does happen, I'm really looking forward to it. Well, it will happen. You know, the other one is, you know, mental institutions, you know, especially the old ones that are abandoned and stuff like that were, you know, mm-hmm. back in the 1800s and stuff like that, you know, they, they were actually tortured pretty much, you know, when they were locked up in one of those oh. places. So you would think. Absolutely horrible. Yeah. I mean, a lot of uh, ghost hunters have told me that that is one of the richest places uh, to, you know, get uh, it stuff. Is. We, we did uh, an investigation of a place called Black Moon Manor uh, in Indiana, oh man, five years ago, maybe even longer. Uh, unfortunately, it's been torn down now because the couple that owned it couldn't get it going fast enough, and the county said, no, you're done. But in that place, it was uh, a mansion that was converted over into a tuberculosis ward. So not exactly mental health, but still around that same issue of a lot of people are very, very sick and a lot of people are dying very, very quickly. Oh yeah. And in that place, you walk, you're outside. It's actually a really, really nice area where the house was. You step in the door and it's like the air is thick and you can just tell this place is going to be different. And it was, you, I mean, the, the shadow movement, the sounds, it was a crazy place. And a lot of it you just can't explain. Um, we we did do a mental institution, geez, seven years ago, maybe. Doesn't doesn't seem like that long ago, but man, I think it was like seven years ago. Uh, and that yeah, we had pieces of evidence there that sounded like a voice, but you really couldn't make out what it said. And is that because of some procedure where the spirit in life had something done to where they could no longer speak anymore and that carried over into the afterlife? Who knows? But it's just so tragic. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, that the people, a lot of them, you know, I hate to say it, there was probably nothing wrong with them, but you know, a lot of the, the treatments they went through, you know, like electrical yeah. shock and treatment like this and, you know, there was Hell one yeah. one case, I can't remember the uh, mental institution, where they even used to put people, like, in little cages. And this is around 1880s, I, 1870s, 1890s, you know, th- th- to control them. And we're talking about a yeah. cage where they can't even stand up. So after they've been in there for about five, ten years, they could never stand up at, anyway. That was it. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We used to have a list of all the things that people would be... I don't want to say experiment on, but it really was an experimentation to see what would happen. And, and some of the things on there now are things where it's like, wow, they, they got, you know, shock treatment for this. I, I, the one that always makes everybody laugh, chronic masturbation. If, if someone dropped you off there and said you were a chronic masturbator, you're getting checked in. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's really, really strange. Everyone who reads it, it's like, wow, Really? That happened? Yeah, it did. Um, there, was, there was a lot of cases where wives would fight with their husbands, and the husbands would drop the wives off to make them more docile. And the doctors took them in. And it's like, I, it's crazy how that could happen. I mean, you know, yeah, 1800s, it was a long time ago, but it wasn't really that long ago. Well, it was a good way, you know, I guess maybe get rid of your wife or get rid of your husband or get rid of somebody you don't like. Maybe he owed money to, you know, it was so much easier to commit yeah. somebody back then. Basically, all you had to do is just take him there and, and, and pay a certain amount of money. And there they were. Right. And then they were gone. They're out of your hair for some cases for the rest of their life. Yeah. And a lot you know, of it. Even if they even if they survived for the rest of their life, they're gone now. That's why I think they're so rich because I mean the mental torture they were going through and and it would be so oh, rich, yeah. you know, of you know, this of their spirits still hanging around. Now, Larry, I gotta ask right. you a question. What got you into well, ghost hunting in the first place? It was about two thousand and eight. Um I was kind of trolling the forums of a lot of different websites. Of course, like most people, it was ghost hunters. 
and, and all the TV shows. Uh, man, that's so cool. So I started getting into the forums and I got into research and I got into evidence analysis. Someone would send a picture and, you know, I was very computery back then as well. So I could tell them, yeah, you can see the pixelation for the ghost is different than the background and, and all this different stuff. And I'd help them let them know, yeah, this is a fake picture or no, this is the real deal. Or uh, I don't know if you remember, but you remember those ghost apps where it put a ghost in the picture? Oh, yeah. I had all the different versions of that on my computer, and I could screenshot which one it was, send it to them, and say, nope, that's the ghost app. Yeah. And, uh, that's how I started. Well, you know, a lot of groups, and I don't know if you ran across any of them. You know, I've had one or two groups on my show that one of them I actually cut off within the first half an hour. Because, you know, yeah. the, you know they, they sent me tons of emails wanting to come on the show. I get them on and I start asking questions like, well, what do you do? And they said, well, we go out to people's houses and we investigate. And then I started asking questions like, well, how long do you investigate when you're at somebody's house? They said an hour or two. And, and just all these <laughs> red flags started, you know, popping up in my head, you know. And I said. Most investigations, it takes me an hour to set up. <laughs> oh yeah or longer and, right and, and then the, the next word out of the, the lady's mouth is well you know we're trying to get picked up by a cable channel for a show uh, on ghost hunting and i said well how long have you guys been at a group oh about six months and, and it, oh, to me yeah. it was more like a, a social gathering that they figured hey we can just you know get a cable channel get a, a show and get very famous but, you know, they did maybe two or three investigations for an hour, hour and a half. They didn't even ask the people right. to leave the house or anything. They were, you know, from what I gathered, they were still walking around while they were investigating. That is not, right. that is not ghost hunting. I am sorry. There are a lot of investigations. We don't really do houses anymore. We try to stay out of houses unless it's an emergency because I don't want to disrupt your life. You know, who am I to kick you out of your house? But at the same token, there's been a lot of houses we've done or a lot of businesses we've done where we're talking with the owner and they're like, okay, well, you know, I can be out of here in about 20 minutes. And, you know, we've told them, we want you to stay. Because our theory is if I walk into, let's just say, I don't know, a tattoo parlor and I'm trying to communicate with the ghost, what's the ghost more likely to communicate? Me, the guy that just walked in for the first time? Or the lady that owns it, that it sees every day, 12 hours a day. You know, so a lot of the times we'll have the owner, a client, or whatever you want to call it, they'll participate in EVP sessions, ghost box sessions, and, and stuff like that. And we'll actually get more responses out of that. Well, I mean, what type of equipment do you guys use when you and uh, to go out and when you're searching, you know, for... Ghost. I mean, uh, what's in your ghost box? Well, uh, unfortunately, we've gone from one box to probably about 10 now. Um, but we have numerous different cameras. Uh, we have two uh, full-spectrum camcorders that we use as static cams. We used to have a DVR system, but it was not HD, and it was such a hassle to set up and tear down. Static cams are, are a lot easier, and we don't have to have someone sitting there babysitting the cameras the whole time. So we have those two static cams that are 1080. We have a third full-spectrum camcorder static cam that's 4K. Uh, we have a IR 4K Sony production camera, which is usually what I'm walking around with. Um, I try to do the majority of the recording on that just because the, the quality is so much better and it's got a gimbal built into the lens. So it, it kind of gets rid of a lot of the shaking. Um, we have a couple different uh, 360 cameras. One of them that uh, records live and, and a lot of times we'll set it up on an investigation and kind of walk away from it so that if anyone's on Facebook and they can kind of just pay attention, you know, they could be in the investigation with us. Oh, wow. And there was one investigation where someone actually noticed movement in the background that none of us had seen. 
So you go back and watch the video, and lo and behold, there's the movement the guy was talking about. Interesting. So it actually helped us catch a piece of evidence. Um, we have a couple different regular white light cameras, um, Nikons and Fujis and, and, and whatnot. Uh, we have a full spectrum Fuji UV camera or yeah, full spectrum Fuji camera. We have a full spectrum point and shoot. I want to say Panasonic or Sony. Um, and it's, it's interesting using both of those cameras at the same location, too, because the, uh, the difference in the quality of the picture is actually really, really vast. The, the Fuji one that we have is a little bit older, so it's got a little bit lower quality to it. But that little bit lower quality allows us to zoom in a little bit better on the pixels, and you can actually see shapes better. Whereas with the point-and-shoot, because it's a lot newer, when you zoom in, everything just pixelates out and you can't actually see what you're looking at. Interesting. So we try to use both. Um, whereas the Fuji is better indoors, the point and shoots better outdoors. So try to cover as many bases as we can with that. We have an IR camera, which we don't really use a whole lot just because you only have so many hands. Um, we have a thermal, which takes pictures and video. Most of the time it's taking video, but we'll snap a couple pictures here and there. Uh, for the Sony camcorder, we have a, a wireless microphone set up to where we can get two people going on the wireless. Because, you know, when you're sitting there with someone in front of the camera and they're talking, if they turn away from the camera, it's really hard to hear them. So we got the wireless so that not only can we hear whoever's leading the EVP session really clearly, but if they're, you know, using something like the ghost box, that microphone on the camera is now picking up the ghost box crystal clear. Now, what's, what's, your, uh, what's your opinion of, on ghost boxes? Originally, when we used it, I was completely skeptical of it. Um, the likelihood of it being a radio station is just too good. So... I didn't really want to use it as much. Unfortunately, because we tend to do a lot of our stuff outdoors, you can't always control the atmosphere. You know, where we're at, there's, there's major trucking routes. So you've got semis going day and night, all night. Um, right now, crickets. Crickets are the bane of my existence right now. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, we had a session where it didn't really sound that loud, but when you go back and listen to it, things are yelling in your ears. Kind of made it difficult. Um, so we'll use the ghost box in that instance simply because an EVP session is impossible. Um, now, as we started using it more, we started messing with the tempo. We started running it backwards. We found that the AM tends to get a little bit more clear answers than FM does. And lo and behold... Now, instead of getting single word answers, there's been a couple times where we have a phrase that answers directly what the question was. Do you remember any of the phrases you ever got back uh, that, that, like, stuck in your head? Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's one in particular. Um, we were at Star Rock State Park. And I want to say 1963, middle-aged women were murdered down in St. Louis Canyon. So we're doing a ghost box session in the canyon because unfortunately it's the middle of the day and there's airplanes going overhead. You can hear trucks. The waterfall is actually really loud. So we're like, you know what? We'll just do ghost box. It's fine. We're doing the ghost box session and over the ghost box, you can hear, I want to say, I want to say the date's the correct one, uh, November 14th. Now, without knowing, you know, November 14th, oh, what's that? November 14th is the date that the murders happened. Oh, wow. And then as soon as it says 14th, it says 17th. So the bodies were discovered on the 16th. So we're not exactly sure why the 17th came across. But November 14th, back to back like that, well, that's, that's a little strange. It's a little hard to explain. 
there was another time where 